This is week three of our, ser- of, our, uh, of our series. We've been studying through the book of Ephesians, and I'm going to go old school on, to, on you today. We're going we're to really go verse by verse. We try to do that often, but, but today, in a, in, a, in, a, in a creeping, plodding, slow sort of a fashion, we're going to hang on many of the words uh, of just a few verses in Ephesians chapter 2. I wasn't planning on doing this, but, but I, I feel compelled to do so. I want to remind you of what we talked about last week. Uh, the whole theme of last week out of Ephesians 1 was Paul wants us to believe in one thing. He wants us to believe, realize, fully embrace the immeasurable greatness of God's power toward those who believe. And that's many of you here today. Paul compels us to realize and to fully embrace the immeasurable greatness of God's power toward those who believe. Now many of us this morning are living uh, largely powerless lives. We don't see much of God's power and presence in our lives. We seem, uh, as it seems as though we're floundering spiritually, not really getting anywhere. Just this morning, I was again just, just uh, reminded of how this, what we're doing here today, is a spiritual battle. And Satan and his minions, they hate you. And, and they hate your family. They, they hate your worship. They hate the idea that you would gather together uh, in order to grow spiritually. They, they hate the idea that you would, you would meet in some building uh, with this want, this desire to know God more deeply. Satan hates that. And, and so it, we, we are compelled, we are compelled to draw near, to realize, to once again embrace the truth that, that, that God, his, his, his immeasur- the immeasurable greatness of his power toward those who believe is the only thing that's holding Satan at bay as we gather together today. I suppose, I suppose uh, Satan wants to, to, to mess with our PowerPoint and turn off our lights and, and create some terrible b- a back noise or, or feedback and, and, and turn the AC into heat and, and anything he could do to, to, to drive us out of this building today. And actually, you don't know this, but in the last 30 minutes, some of that's been going on. And, and, and yet, what we, what we stake, uh, what, what we believe, what, what, we, what we claim, what we build our foundation on is... God's immeasurably great power toward us. That's all free. That's all like I didn't even plan on, plan on saying that. But that's last week. If you didn't hear that sermon last week, you, you, not because it was a great sermon, but because it was a true sermon, you should go and listen to it online. So today we're moving on into chapter 2 of Ephesians, and I want to give you some... I want to give you some definitions of some words that you may have been using all of your life. If you grew up in the church, you, uh, you've been using these words all your life. If you're, if you're new to the church, maybe you are a new convert. I mean, you just recently have submitted your life to Jesus. Uh, nonetheless, you've heard these words. If we could put these two definitions up. One is grace. Like, what is grace? We talk about it all the time. We, we want to afford one another grace. We believe that the grace has been bestowed on us from, 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 from our Heavenly Father, from God. What is grace? Well, this is a, this is a pretty compact definition. Is that me squeaking? It's not me? Okay. Then I won't worry about it. Uh, basic but true definition of the word grace would be this. God's goodness toward those who des- really deserve only punishment. That is people, uh, human beings who, who rebel against God and we, we push against God and, and we want to be God and we want to do it our own way and we want to find our own path and we want, to, we, want to, uh, we want to be God. We deserve punishment, but God instead bestows on us goodness, though we don't deserve it. That's God's grace. The second definition. You, you see it up there. I, I could have used the word salvation. 
and maybe I should have because often I wonder when we talk about salvation, if I use that word, if, if some of you know what that means, but I've chosen to, to use the term saving faith. Because you can put your faith in anything, right? And we all have. We're all, we're all hoping in stuff that, 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 that won't deliver, that, that really won't come through for us, but nonetheless we have placed our faith, many of us in other things at, at, at times and maybe even currently, but, but saving faith, these are, these, are, these are Christian tenets or beliefs, beliefs, saving faith would be a trust in Jesus Christ as a living person. He's the God-man. Fully God, fully man to this day. A, a trust in him for my forgiveness, the forgiveness of my sins, and they are many. And secondly, a trust in Jesus, the, the, the person, uh, the, the God-man Jesus, my trust in Jesus for eternal life with God. So there's this twofold blessing in this saving faith. I, I'm, I'm forgiven, and then I, I am placed in, at the table of God, in, the, in this family of God for eternity. I'm not, just, I'm not just forgiven, but then kicked to the curb. I'm forgiven, and I'm welcomed at the table of God. I'm an adopted child of God. That is, that is saving faith. And it's important that we have working definitions of those two words as we dive into Ephesians chapter 2 today. So now let us do that. I'll read out loud and, and you follow along silently. We're going to read 10 verses. Ephesians chapter 2. Paul says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Verse 4 says, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. And then there's this parenthetical statement. By grace you have been saved. Continuing on with the sentence. And raised, up, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace... You have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. So, Paul's intention today, at least in the beginning of this passage, uh, Paul begins this, ten ver this, this section of ten verses with a, with a gut check, a reality check, if, if, you were, if you were following along closely, you, you maybe feel that, felt that rather. Uh, it, it's Paul saying, look, let's be honest with one another. Let's be honest with ourselves regarding our former condition. Regarding our, our natural state 
the state in which we were born prior to God's grace, prior to saving faith, what we used to be. Let's, let's be honest about who we used to be, who we were born as, just our natural selves. And he says this, you, me, I, we were once dead in our trespasses. And I ask you, what does that mean? We throw that around all the time, but, but let's, we're, we're going we're gonna to slow and, and plotting, we're going to work through this today. What does that mean? That, that we are dead in our trespasses. Well, dead really only means one thing. It's not flowery, flowery or, or metaphorical or, or, or terribly complex. Uh, dead means dead. You know, there's no other kind. There's only one kind of dead. And so I think maybe, uh, maybe an important question would be to ask, why does Paul use the word dead? Not sick, dead. Not dying, dead. Why does Paul use the word dead? And I believe it's because it is one of those binary aspects of life. Meaning, the light's either on or the light's off. It's binary. There are only two. It's either one or the other. There, there, aren't, there, 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 are, there are not a lot of really binary aspects to life. And in fact, it's one of the problems that we have culturally. We, we turn things, uh, we make everything binary. It's, it is the major problem. I'm going to go ahead and say it that way. Uh, I think I, I, it, is, it is the major problem, I believe, with politics. We are forced into a binary system where we say either, either my leader, my leader, on whatever, my leader is always right or he's always wrong. It's, it's always this way and it's never that way or it's always this way and it's never that way. And, and binary thinking is a very dulled down way to think about life. But in this case, Paul says it's just that simple. You were dead. It's not a scale of 1 to 10. That's Paul's point. He's explaining your formally or your formal spiritual condition. I hate to say that. Well, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I mean this in love. Your mama wouldn't say this to you, but, but you were a zero. Like, like that's what Paul's saying. Like on a spiritual scale, every one of us, we were born at zero. Dead. And this is important for us to embrace because we tend to grade ourselves spiritually on a curve. On a one to ten scale. Uh, I'm like, I'm a, I'm a white middle class American and I don't do drugs, so, so I get to start at a four. God saved me from a four, but some of you guys are zeros. And... and and Paul's point is, no. No. Left to ourselves, no matter how well you clean up, no matter how well you have performed in life, except by the saving grace of God in your life, you're dead. We judge others as more desperately sinful than ourselves. We do that all the time. And Paul says, no, every one of us, every one of us, except for God's saving grace in our lives, every one of us, hopeless, helpless, powerless, whole theologies have been built on the idea that you are not completely powerless. And Paul says, no, you were dead. You need to understand that. You were powerless to save 
yourself. Before I, I dive a little further into this bad, into this bad news, <clears throat> let me tell you where Paul is headed. Paul is headed toward the good news, okay? He's laying this groundwork and it seems, um, it seems like a bummer because it's supposed to be a bummer, but he's, he's headed toward the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The bad news is you can't save yourself. The good news is God did that. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take us on just a, a brief, just a chase a rabbit, just, just briefly, and I actually, I actually touched on this in my, my, my uh, intro, or, or the, the words I said before the sermon, but, but okay, so in chapter 1, I talked about this a minute, a minute ago, just briefly, he, Paul, unpacks the immeasurable greatness of God's power toward us. And he did that, I, here's what I believe, this is what I preached on last week, he did that in chapter 1, he unpacked um, God, the, the, the immeasurable greatness of God's power toward those who believe, he unpacked that, I believe, as a foundation on which now he's going to unpack uh, or, 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 or build this case for how utterly helpless we were. Why? So that he can shed light on how much power it took for you and I to be saved. That was not a small thing. That's Paul's point. It took the immeasurably great power of God in our lives. It took that much power to save us because we were dead. In other words, the idea that somehow I took part in my own salvation and I was, I was kind of okay before God showed up is hogwash. That's Paul's point. And you'll see that as we unpack these verses more and more. Look what God did. That is where Paul is headed here. That's where we're going today. Okay. So Paul says, you were powerless <laughs> in, in two ways. Look at verse just verse 2. Let's go to the next screen. It says this. In which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. The course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit at work in the sons, and I would say in the daughters of of disobedience. So, so there are two ways, two ways that you are powerless. This is the first way. This is the first way. The first way is you are, you're following the way of the world. And then some of us, to this day, we're still, we're still on that path. You're following the way of the world. You, 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 you're like a slave uh, to the world. So, oh, I think I can manage my life, Randy. You can't manage anything. We're just, we're, we're in sync, it says. We're in sync with, with the, the devil. We're in sync with his, his little uh, um, demons that are, that, that, that have our, our they, they got our number, they got our address, they, 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 they're reading your mail. And, and, and Paul says, there's, there's one way in which you're hopeless, there are two ways in which you're hopeless, but the first way is that that, that you, you're just following the course of the rest of the world and, and Satan has your number. You're in sync with the devil. That, that's, Paul says that's the first way in which we are hopeless, helpless, dead, slaves to sin and the devil. But then there's a second way, and if we can put that verse up there, there's a second way in which we are hopeless Verse 3 says, among whom we all once lived in the, the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So this is the second way in which we are hopeless. And, and what is the second way? It's that, that we're, we're hopeless because we're sinful by nature. 
Not only are we slaves to the, the ways of the world and, and, and in sync with, with Satan himself, but the second way in which we're hopeless is we're, we're hopeless by nature, living in the passions of, of your own flesh. Led by your own fleshly passions, your own bodily desires. Uh, it says that you, that, that, I, that we were and perhaps some of us still are in this room today, we were children of wrath. And all of this is meant to make us feel hopeless toward a greater end, but, but, but that, is, that is the point because we are. Satan is my problem, Paul says, and I am my own problem. That's what Paul is saying. Satan is my problem and I am my problem. You, my, your, your mind, your, your body, by nature, a child of wrath. And unless and until I am made alive in Christ, I am dead. Satan is my problem. What does that look like? Well, in, in, in many ways, in many ways, this first way in which we're hopeless, in many ways, perhaps you're, you're just like everyone else. You're, you, you're just like uh, your, your worst friends. You're, you're depraved like your worst friends. You, you follow the same system as, as, as your friends. You've got, a, you've got a different set of beliefs, but, but in reality, in reality, you're in sync with the world. You're in sync with the devil, which really, there's no difference. That's the first way in which we're hopeless. And then this second way, I am my own problem. Um, and the, uh, the example that comes to my mind is of how we... We're just, we're just children of wrath. We're just living out our own fleshly passions. We just go to the lowest com common denominator. We just do what, what feels good. And we will worry about it later if, if ever. Paul says that's the second way in which I'm hopeless until Christ comes along. I, I'm just by nature sinful. Um... The example that comes to my mind is the crazy fact. The crazy fact that, that I know men personally. I know pastors personally. Who've, who have thrown away families. Like, like an old pair of shoes. They've, they've thrown away wife and children. Like... like like, a, like yesterday's newspaper. And I, I just, I look at him like, like that, is, that doesn't even make sense. That is so crazy. And, and they, they do that, they do that for, for what? For like, like a few minutes of tintillation. It, it doesn't even make sense. Like if it was a math problem, you would be getting the math problem Wrong, but this is the, the, that sort of crazy behavior and many other crazy behaviors is evidence that by nature, left to ourselves, we are natural born, flesh impassioned children of wrath. Just, just doing, doing, seeking pleasure. Fulfilling our, our, our bodily desires, but, but spiritually dead. And the point is, again, the point is, it takes a lot of power to save you from the depth of your hopelessness. It takes the immeasurable greatness of God's power Power toward those who believe to save us. Paul's saying, it's going to take a lot of power to save you, buddy. It's 
gonna, it's going to take a lot of power to save me. That's where Paul's headed. So that's the bad news. But, or, or, or to use Paul's words, but God. But God. The two perhaps most glorious words Paul ever penned. But God. Let's look at that verse. It says this. But God. But God being rich in mercy. Because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. You say on a scale to, from 1 to 10, I'm like a 4, and Paul says, no. You say, I haven't done the wretched things I hear they do in New York City. And Paul says, no, we're all zeros, spiritually dead. And then he says, but God, rich in mercy. What is this immeasurable, great, measurably great power of God? What has it accomplished for us? It says, but God, rich in mercy, even when we were dead, made us alive. God did that. And we are, uh, we are really into, uh, into uh, autonomy and, and individualism and, and we're really as a church into personal salvation and, and I am too, but, but, but Paul here is pointing out, he's saying, look, it took, it took massive power to save you. The, the, the power of God to make living people out of dead people, that, Paul says, is astounding. Verse 5 Verse 5, there's this, there's this parenthetical statement that, that actually grammatically doesn't have to be there. You see it, I put it in italics just to draw, to, to, to draw attention to it. By grace you have been saved. Now, now, Paul doesn't have to say that. Here's why Paul doesn't have to say that. Well, Paul can say whatever he wants. But, but he's about to say that in two of the most famous ver in, in the, two of the most famous verses in the Bible, right? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. He's about to say that in just a few verses. By grace you've been saved. So, so why, does he, why does he stop mid-sentence and say, by grace you've been saved? But God, <clears throat> but God being rich in mercy, because of, the, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, passes, made us alive together with Christ. Go to verse 6. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. See, he didn't have to put that in there. For, for that to be a complete thought, for that to be a complete sentence, you can just go right to verse 6 after Christ. But he chose to put that in. By grace you have been saved. Why? Why does he stick that in there? I believe what he's saying is, listen folks, the, the disposition of God, the, the mind and the character of God, and, and the, the, the power of God to make living people out of dead people, he said, that is astounding. God, God's, God's, God's will, God's <clears throat> mind and, and character and, and power determining to, to take a dead person and make him alive in Christ. Like, he says, that's astounding. You know, we, th we think we... <clears throat> We, because we prayed some prayer that we, we somehow get some credit for our salvation. And, and that's, that's a dream that, 
Maybe someone told you, but Paul says, except for the immeasurable power of God toward you, you would still be dead. And some of you know that full well. There's some beautiful life stories in this room today, some beautiful testimonies. Some of you would say, like, I was a wretched mess on my way to hell. And I was like running full speed. And except by the immeasurable greatness of God's power in my life, I would still be running or I would already be in hell. Like I had no intention of turning around. But God. But God. Rich in mercy. Now if we can for the remainder of our time, if we can camp out on, on verse 8. Just a few more minutes here. We'll, we'll spend some time on eight. Um, and you would, you would perhaps say, um, depending on your, your thoughts on salvation or your, your upbringing or whatever, you might even be a little offended by what I've said, uh, what Paul said. Um, but, but you might ask this question. You, you, you might say, what about faith? What about my faith, Randy? And I, I don't discount that at all. We're going to talk about that right now. You say, what about my faith, Randy? Didn't my, didn't my faith, I mean, I, I, I at least did that, right? I at least, the faith thing, I at least did that. I put my faith in Jesus. Didn't that save me? And let's, let's, look at, let's look at verse 8. It says this. We already read it once, but it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. The, the the, the hundred dollar question is, what, what is this referring to? For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. It says, for we are his workmanship. To like cure the apple of God's eye. He's so, he's... He's so proud of you. And he created you in Jesus for good works. That, that's what he created you for. He's your daddy. Your child. And he created you in Christ Jesus for good works. Which he, which he prepared beforehand. This, this has always been his intention. That, that we should walk in them. Okay. So faith. I, I started today. I started today with a working definition of saving faith. You, you remember that. I, I highly esteem saving faith. I think it, I think it to be essential. Saving faith. Faith is the evidence. Faith is the evidence that we have been raised from the dead. You see, the this, and this is not your own doing. If you go and you you really dive into the, the language and the grammar and the original language and the original gr grammar, what, what, you will, what you will arrive at is that this is referencing the entire uh, sentence prior. For by grace you have been saved through faith. So, so this isn't just referring to grace. This isn't just referring to faith. It's saying that whole thing. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And then, and then Paul says, and this, the fact that by grace you have been saved through faith, Paul says, all that is not your doing. So I would tell you that faith is the evidence the evidence that you have been raised from the dead. For a dead man has no capacity toward faith. Does he? Does she? 
A dead man can't do anything. A dead woman can't do anything. He, she is in fact dead, right? Is zero. No ability to do anything. If you've ever had a loved one that, that you had a beef with and then they died, listen, you need to give that beef up because they have no longer any capacity to make it right. They're dead. And that's Paul's point. Faith, when you see faith come alive in your heart, what you say is, ah, evidence. Evidence that, 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 that God's grace has taken root in my heart. Evidence that I've been raised from the dead. When my children were born, the first sign that they were alive was a cry, right? You hear that cry and it's evidence. Or, or, or red-faced angry screams like like I was so comfortable why did you why did you bring me out here right you know you've, you've experienced that or or maybe some of you experienced this we have like they, they come out and the first thing they do is they vomit and, and you're like okay that's gross but what that tells me is this child it's evidence this child is alive and that is good news You know, what Paul's saying is the faith that you have in your heart, that has taken root in your heart, that saving faith, it is evidence that you're no longer dead in your sins. The capacity to have faith is evidence. So, so spiritually speaking, the first sound, the first sound that a newborn Christian utters is faith. But, but even this, Paul says, even this, it's not anything that we can take credit for. It's, it's, it, this is not your own doing. This, even this, it is a gift of God. Not something that, that you earn. Not something that came as a result of your good behavior. Uh, not something that you can boast about. No one gets to boast. What is Paul's ultimate goal here? Uh, it, it, it's, it's twofold. He's saying no one, no one can boast here, folks. No one can take credit. No one can say, like, man, if all those other people that don't know Jesus, if they were good like me... Four on the scale, they'd one day get saved, but they're just beyond hope. And not me. And Paul says, no, no one can boast. Paul's ultimate goal here is really twofold. Number one, my humility. Number two, God's fame. My humility, God's glory and praise. And then verse 10 and then verse 10, the result of God's saving grace in my life, the result is what? It's it's good works. It's good works. It's, it's, doing, it's, it's living the life that Christ has called us to. It's, it's doing the things that, that emulate the things that Christ did. It's saying Christ did this, I'm going to do that too. It's reading the Old Testament and reading the New Testament and saying God's heart, it tends in this direction. God's heart is like a river running this direction. And so my behavior, my actions, my good works are going to go in that same direction because the result of God's saving grace in my life is good works. That's always been God's intention to create in you a new living creation intended for good works. You were a dead man, you were a dead woman, but now you are alive in Christ, but there's a purpose for that, and that is that you might do good works. That's always what God has intended. That is what he prepared ahead of time. Your good works. I, I think if we, if we brought a, a lazy Christian up here on the stage who, who is still in, in love with the ways of the world and still in love with himself and, and still in love with his secret passions, 
still in love with his own sin. I think according to this we'd have to say that he's not a Christian at all. He's not a believer at all. Because Paul says that the whole point being, being made alive in, in Christ. The whole point is that you are now God's creation intended to do good works, intended to follow his teachings, and intended to emulate the life of Christ. Not just say I've got this head knowledge. Not just say I, 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 I agree with, the, with the, what's on the page. Not, not just say like I have this set of beliefs that I that I hold to be true. No, no, it's, 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 there's, there's a heart change that, that turns into a life change. God has, in raising you to new life, created a new person capable and expressly designed to do good works. So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to land this plane now, okay? Um, prior, prior to all of this, prior to all of this, you could not see the glory of God. One day, uh, he's boring, and, and he's demanding, and he's a killjoy, and He's scary, not very relevant to life. But then the next day, the next morning, you can't get enough of him. What happens? You go from death unto life. You know, what I want to say is, this is not an experience. This is the supernatural immeasurable greatness of God's power in your life. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you three big, big takeaways. I'm just going to read them and then we're going we're gonna to run to the table of communion where we again celebrate the grace of God in our lives. Three big takeaways. Here are three reasons why this is so important. Why this is so life changing if you embrace this truth. Here's why it's important. Three big takeaways. Number one, I already said this. Number one, salvation is not a feeling. It's, it's the immeasurably great power of God, of God in your life. It's not a feeling. If it's a feeling, then tomorrow you wake up and you're like, man, I suck and I must not be saved. Or, or, or if it's a feeling, then perhaps you spend like entire summers of your adolescent life. Many of us did this. Entire summers of your adolescent life uh, Laying in bed in the heat of a summer night worrying that maybe you're not really saved. Because maybe that prayer wasn't, or, or maybe you didn't do enough, or, or maybe, no, maybe you don't feel like it. And in all of the complexities of our feelings and our emotions and our good days and our bad days, what I want to compel you to believe is that salvation is not a feeling. It is the powerful working of God in your life. Second big takeaway. No one is beyond saving. Do you believe that? No one is beyond the saving hand of our God. No one is too bad. No one is too lost. <laughs> no one is too difficult a case. The power of God saves Saves us from being zeros. Every one of us. The point is, don't give up. Don't give up on your child. Don't give up on your spouse. Don't give up on your, your friend. No one is beyond 
the saving power of God. And the third takeaway would be this. Unbeliever, if that's you today, no doubt, no doubt some of us here today were, we're skeptics or we're unbelievers or we're unaffiliated or whatever you want to, whatever you want to call it. Unbeliever, God is hot on your heels today. He's after you. Why resist him any further? Why run any faster? I invite you today, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Submit to Jesus' saving work on the cross on your behalf. Come to Jesus. Let's pray.